everyone, welcome back. Uh, this session is titled Working with the Food Industry on Improving Aquatic Animal Welfare. So we'll be spending the next hour together exploring the synergies among different stakeholders to learn what is the best path forward to improving welfare conditions for aquatic animals. I'm Sofika Kosnyuk, Managing Director of Aquatic Life Institute. As a few housekeeping reminders before we get started, the audience is muted upon entry and your cameras are turned off. When you have questions, please post them in the question and answer box and we'll answer as many of those as possible following the presentations. Every session is being recorded as well as streamed live on Facebook. We do expect respectful, productive discussions and have a zero tolerance policy for harassment and discrimination of any kind. So today we have three fantastic panelists joining us. We'll have around 45 minutes of presentations and then 10 minutes of questions and answers. Um, I am absolutely delighted to be able to introduce to you our three panels that you see up here on the screen alongside me. We have Shannon Davis from the Global Animal Partnerships Farm Team which she joined in 2019 to create GAP's first welfare standards for farmed fish. And this started with farming Atlantic salmon. Uh, at the start of the launch, um, she, is, she was just thrilled to be able to continue making a difference in the lives of millions of fish. Next, and please correct me if my pronunciation is wrong, we have Murillo Quintiliano, executive director, Oh, did I do it? I did it. <laughs> thank you. I faked it. Uh, thank you. From five farms in Brazil, Murillo has been participating as a speaker and expert in several global conferences, sharing his experience, knowledge, and understanding of the struggles of applying science on farming um, environments that will forward sustainability and lastly, I'm very, very proud to introduce my coworker, Catalina Lopez, who's the director of the Aquatic Animal Alliance, which is the coalition of organizations that the Aquatic Life Institute is working with that span the globe. And uh, the, the shared aim is to reduce suffering of aquatic animals. Catalina also happens to be a veterinarian from Colombia. Um, so without further ado, I would love to turn it over to our panelists. We'll hear from Shannon, then Murillo, and then Catalina. Shannon, would you like to kick it off? And you're very welcome to share your screen if you have any slides. Great. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, let me just share my screen. All right, well, while that's loading, there we go. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone at ALI for inviting me to speak today. Um, like Sofika said, my name is Shannon Davis. I am the Aquaculture Welfare Specialist Global Animal Partnership. And I'm excited to speak to you a bit more about my organization today and also our work in fish welfare. So we are a Animal Welfare Rating and Certification or Labeling and Certification Organization established in 2008. So we're about 12 years old. Um, we're also an independent nonprofit and our team is not only passionate, but we all have um, degrees in animal behavior and welfare. So we're bringing that expertise to bear as well um, in our work for GAP. And our goal ultimately is to positively impact the lives of farm animals raised for food. Um, a brief overview kind of of how our program works. So the farm team of which I am a part, um, we create standards for how animals should be, farm animals should be raised. And then we use independent third party certifiers around the globe to audit those farms. Um, once those farms are certified, they can either label themselves or sell their product onto suppliers and producers, which um, 
can use the Gap label in the marketplace. And then hopefully when the consumer sees our label on a protein product, um, they know that that's animal welfare certified and it's been raised to a high standard. And we're one of the largest animal welfare labeling and certification organizations in North America, but we do have a global reach. So that means that we rate or that our farms in our system raise over 416 million animals annually to our standard. Um, and actually we just passed, surpassed that 4,000 farm um, limit this past month. So very exciting that we now have over 4,000 farms uh, certified for GAP standards in our system, which means that over 2,500 certified products are carried in over 5,000 outlets. And again, that's globally. So now that I've given a brief little overview about our organization, I'm gonna speak a bit more about how we create our animal welfare standards. So GAP's program is based on these three core tenets um, of how we define animal welfare. So that's health and productivity, natural living, and emotional well-being. Health and productivity, as you might expect, speaks to basically the biological health of farm animals. So, you know, we want to make sure that they're not sick, they're not suffering from any diseases or infections, things like that. Natural living speaks more to the principle of going beyond just what the animal needs and giving them things that they want. So we think about their entire life cycle, um, their life history and their behavior to create or to ask for environments in our standards that reflect the things that they most want. And then for emotional well-being, how I often describe it is, you know, if you think about the healthiest pig in the world, would you say that it had a good life if it was confined in a small cage alone? Probably not. So emotional well-being speaks to those other aspects, those social aspects um, of a farm animal's life that we want to make sure our standards address. Um, so that we can holistically provide um, the highest amount of animal welfare possible. And really importantly, our standards are based in science. So we have a rigorous research and development process when we start a new standard. Um, personally, that's my favorite part of the process. Um, you know, we're looking at all of the latest science, consulting with our scientific advisory committee, often putting together technical working groups with expertise on that specific species, um, and just basically ensuring to the extent that we can that whatever standard we draft reflects the most up-to-date science in the field. And then there's the drafting process, um, which always takes longer than we expect, <laughs> but um, we, once we put this enormous document together, um, the most important part of this whole thing, I think, is the field testing and collaboration piece. Uh, you can create a really robust standard, but ultimately, if it's not achievable on farm, no one's going to use it, and we are not able to impact farm animals positively. So that field testing process is really key to ensuring that our standard is achievable on farm. And we work, we take like a multi-stakeholder approach. So we work with the farmers, we work with industry and scientists again to ensure that we've got that standard and all the pieces that work. Um, and then based on all of that feedback, we revise, revise, revise until finally um, we've got a draft that we feel good about and ready to send to our board for final approval and then launch. So uh, a few of the things that kind of set my organization apart from other animal welfare certification labeling organizations in the marketplace first of all is that our program is comprehensive. So I mean that in a few different ways comprehensive in terms of the amount of species that we certify. So hopefully by the end of this year, fingers crossed, that'll be up to 10 with Farmed Atlantic Salmon. Um, comprehensive in terms of the standards themselves. So we look at the animal's entire life cycle from birth to slaughter and write standards addressing each step of the way. Um, comprehensive in terms of the production systems we want to uh, get certified. So anything from, you know, small farms to 
uh, in ter- I can only really speak in terms of salmon, but you know, land-based versus open sea cages, we want to make sure that we are allowing any type of production system to be able to be certified to our standard and comprehensive in terms of supply chain. So uh, we want to make sure that from farm to fork, um, the consumer knows that that animal is has been traceable and it has the gap label on it. We're also very importantly a tiered program. Um, so at our base level, farms have to meet over 100 standards to get certified. And we believe that great animal welfare is achievable at all of our step levels. But as we move up the steps, um, generally speaking, they grow more and more robust and for our terrestrial species at least, reflects the animal's natural environment. Um, and just a quick note, um, obviously these will not be the labels for our fish. Um, if you know any uh, seafood person, they're not gonna put a label with a chicken, a pig and a cow on their seafood. Um, but uh, our things are, our labels are not finalized yet. So um, this is just reflecting our terrestrial species at the moment. But um, so these step levels allow continuous improvement and also allow farms to come in from, you know, a variety of places in terms of their development on the animal welfare scale. So it's really all about having as much positive impact as we possibly can. And then importantly as well, um, we require all of our farms in our system to be audited by those independent third party certifiers every 15 months. Um, while group certification can be beneficial for, you know, smaller farms or, you know, littler groups that are struggling financially, maybe, we think it's really important for the integrity of our program to make sure that we're, that our certifiers are seeing every single farm. Um, if you think about the requirements for group certification, they may only see a small percentage of farms every year. So let's say one out of 10 in a group, that could take 10 years to see every single farm in that system. So that's just a little bit too long and not enough oversight for us. And we want to maintain, like I said, the integrity of our program and the robustness. And that's through making sure that, like I said, our certifiers are seeing every single farm every 15 months. And then finally, I'm going to speak to you guys a little bit about why we got into aquaculture. So as Sophika said, I was brought on in 2019 to head our fish welfare program, um, starting with Farmed Atlantic Salmon. And, you know, GAP as an organization, like I said, brings a lot of expertise and knowledge, not only about animal welfare and creation of standards and certification, but also the auditing process, supply chain, working with businesses. And we felt that it was really important to bring that to aquaculture. Um, it also provides a really exciting opportunity, I think, to increase our reach and positive impact on farm animals. So if you look at even some of the largest cattle farms in Australia or the Western United States, the number of animals just does not compare to even a small salmon farm. So um, really exciting to potentially be, you know, positively impacting millions more animals uh, through our program and certification. And then um, in terms of those things that I just spoke about as a standouts for the GAP program, those apply in the aquaculture space as well. So currently there's no uh, tiered animal welfare standard for aquaculture that can be applied across any production system in any country. So we're not just writing a standard for open sea Atlantic salmon farms in Norway. We want, you know, land-based in Chile or um, somebody's experimental other interesting thing that they're doing in, you know, Florida, the United States. So um, again, just trying to have as much positive impact as possible and seeking to kind of like fill that gap um, with starting with farmed Atlantic salmon. So hopefully that gave you guys a good idea of the organization, what we do, um, and thank you very much for taking the time today. Looking forward to the other panelists and the question and answer session. Thanks. Thank you so much, Shannon. What a um, tightly, tightly presented, comprehensive uh, overview of what the GAP is doing and how you're entering into the aquaculture space. 
I actually come from the ratings and certification mm -hmm. space myself. So I find this incredibly intriguing that the gap is, uh, or gap is committed to drilling down into some of those specifics and differentiating throughout the life cycle of the animal, as well as differentiating for specific geographies and um, aquaculture operations, because they vary so greatly even from yes. farm to farm. So that is a big challenge, um, I think, that, that you're probably dealing with right now. But I think that it is um, definitely going to advance uh, the conversation for, for everyone. So I'm really keen yes. to see how, how that begins to unfold. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and now over to Murillo. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Sofika, for introduction. Nice presentation, Shannon. Shannon very, very enlightened. Thank you very much for the organizers, in special to Catalina for all the contact and the hard work to put us, all, all of us together. Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'd like to start introducing a little bit of what is FAI about, what is my background, and what we do. Uh, well, I am an animal scientist. My entire uh, work since the university has been linked to animal welfare, especially or starting with terrestrial animals. And I've been participating in several activities involving the transition for better uh, welfare uh, environment on the farming and also on the industry. And uh, working with FAI brings this opportunity because we are a multidisciplinary group to work both on day to day with farming and farming groups, but also to big uh, big brands and uh, big industry representatives, uh, globally speaking, all over all over the world. Uh, no matter if you're working with farmers or working uh, with those big brands and the industry, our approach and our framework is always the same. We try to connect economics, environment, and the ethics, and where uh, people and uh, animal welfare is included to bring out action and solutions to in order to face uh, the problems that we, we see and we realize all over the, the food supply, the supply chain. Uh, what we understand about how welfare is connected to these, and now especially aqua welfare, aquatic, aquatic life welfare, is that uh, we understand and the learning from the terrestrial animals is that animal welfare science and practicalities can be the glue to solve problems uh, 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 around the, the especially on developing areas of the world and developing species, problems that aquaculture, especially uh, aquaculture farming is facing. We understand that different supply chains actors have different agendas and goals as established business. So not necessarily what a farm uh, struggle with is what a retailer or a, a restaurant chain or the industry struggle with in terms of the day-to-day -day business operations. So we see that as a possible problem that makes the, the, new, uh, the, the, the new view about how the world should work by taking in account the environmental, the welfare interactions and the social interactions, uh, 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 trends where it's going. So we understand that this is a problem. The proposition is that we can use animal welfare to connect those different uh, very specific problems or very uh, specific struggles uh, to, to make it better. And the action is using holistic management strategies and tools that can bring the economics, the environmental, and the ethical aspects of uh, food production to the same, to the same table for a very uh, development or a very uh, targeted uh, thinking about improvement approach. And for that, uh, in our minds and with the people that we partnership with, 
having an animal centered approach is a very unique and very powerful tool because by the stronger strong animal welfare science that we're going to have and is, is developing by the expertise and the practical applicabilities of that if we can evaluate check and guarantee that the animals are having a life that deserve uh, that worth living uh, it's possible to also automatically understand that you are going to have a better environment and of course better behavior and of course better nutrition and of course better health and our identification when starting our uh, aquaculture work uh, several years ago is that uh, science and the practical aspects and even now the stakeholders and, and the supply chain understands a lot about nutrition understands a lot about health struggle about understanding the environment and how to make it better and until the re more, most recent years fish behavior and understanding how are the interactions with the fish or crustaceans uh, with the, the, the water and with the people uh, has been a lack of those sort of knowledge and was not integrated in the entire uh, holistic overview of what is best for uh, uh, aquaculture or is better for a fish farming uh, procedures. So bringing all of those together, we understand that we can uh, reduce pain and suffering on individuals uh, or and also in groups. And when I say about individuals, is about more linked to chronic pain, where problems that are there that are not being assessed are not being taken in account, but are dragging uh, pain and suffering for animals, and of course acute problems. Uh, and when we talk about aquaculture life, and for me coming from uh, beef, cattle, broiler, pig, uh, laying hen industry, talking about 20% losses, 50% losses, uh, well, animals dying and this becoming normal or just being discussed as well. Fish dies that's happened is, is a little bit confusing to me. I, I think it's almost unacceptable. So changing the conversation around if we can identify groups of individuals, if we can assess how is the life, the quality of life of the fish during the time he is on the farm, during the time he is being transported, or even on the seconds before he's being slaughtered, it's possible to guarantee that the animals has a life worth living. And of course, the experience with animal welfare all over the world shows that once you improve welfare, you have a better uh, 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 you reduce qualitative losses and you reduce quantitative losses and you have a better quality of the product and of course a, a better market access. So this we understand that using one welfare or using a, a animal welfare as the glue as the center point we will automatically reduce inputs reduce losses, improve yields, improve quality, improve environment, improve market access, which are, is now the economical metrics or most of the economical metrics being used in currently from any uh, aquatic life uh, uh, related industry. And of course, uh, improve the quality of life for humans. We understand that the economic benefit of farming or wild catching and the industry behind it, that is based on the economical return. And if we can put all of those aspects on the same metrics, taking in account behavior, taking in account environment, uh, it's possible to drive progress. Uh, and the entire scene, if I can tell you, we are facing a very similar problem than the poultry or the pig industry faced 30, 40 years ago. The focus on aquaculture, uh, especially on fish farming, is very much on health, uh, is very much on disease challenges, is very much on nutritional challenges, is not taking into account the needs of the animal. So the understanding we have is that we don't need to go through this entire process, waiting for 30, 40 years to realize that actually this is not the best route, 
we are giving good health, we are providing good nutrition, but we are the animals are actually suffering from uh, from a more broader uh, welfare perspective. So it's possible to pick that up and starting making the change right now. Uh, of course, it is, is more easier to say for developing activities like tilapia, shrimp, or carp, and a little bit more difficult to, to talk about salmon where the industry is much developed and probably it's already on a way where they need to give a little bit step back, review what has been done and try to, to improve. But the, the, the opportunity with developing areas and developing species is that we can prevent the, the production system to go that route because there are very basic struggles on most of those species that can be addressed right now and taking animal welfare in account. And I would like to use, to, to, to use this time to show some of the examples and different strategies and different actions that we, we are having with different actors. So one interesting example is understanding, evaluating, and reporting. As percent, as you know, is one of the largest uh, 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 fish fish catching industries of the world. But we've been helping them to create sustainability uh, strategy creation, materiality analysis, and sustainability reporting. So what they are really interesting interested is to understand. We have a second example with MNS, and the third example is where I'm going to spend a little bit more time. So we ha are, have been helping Esperson to basically understand what is the materiality around their supply chain and their activities and how best they can approach sustainability issues involved with their, their uh, products and their practice. So it's basically uh, helping them to realize what they need to be looking for to make improvements. And it's up to them to make that improvement uh, uh, according to their strategies. Uh, on a second step, we have uh, Mark and Spencer, and as you know, it's one of the largest uh, 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 supermarkets chains uh, of, of the world. So it has several uh, farms that are dependent and is, is, is inside their supply chain. And the way we work with MNS is a little bit different. We are actually, uh, helping them to define welfare outcome measures to identify problems on their supply chain and where they can correctly uh, uh, give feedback and, and support uh, those improvements. Uh, more focus on, on the fish sector is collecting supply chain information, which we call the fish tracker, help guide sourcing decisions, complete the analysis, and we assess brand risk issues and this is a partnership with WWF that is possible to hate uh, those suppliers to MNS accordingly, some very specific tracking uh, 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 and specific measures defined by the working group. And this is just a sample of how the selecting farms work. So it's an online tool that's been developed where we can identify where the suppliers are, what are the problems, and of course, that will help to create alerts or to, to organize and to provide it really nice feedback to the farm representatives and their, and their supply chain in what is needed to improve because MNS has a very clear welfare uh, standards, practice, and guidance in how they want uh, their products to be, uh, to be produced and displayed in their stores. Uh, just here, those data is just an examples of the understanding that we are being able to provide. So those data are just examples. They are not real data, but this is, for example, is volumes by country and origin of species. So understanding which area is responsible for a specific species that has been supplied to the supermarkets. And from that, trying to identify very specific actions for that region in order to solve or to promote improvement. Uh, here we have data that has been collected by species captured and method of capture. So this is not fish farming as, as, you, as you see, this is uh, fishing being uh, captured. 
so wild catch. So, but also helping to understand. And interestingly, uh, people uh, think that this is well known, and everybody is aware of where it is, where the supply chain, and how it works. But the deep analysis of those information and providing insight, insightful information to what are the back act, best actions to be taken on very specific supply chains is much more powerful. So we stop being too, uh, 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 to a big overview about everything. Fish welfare is nice. You need to take care of your animals to very specific actions to reduce and to improve sustainability and welfare on your supply chain. And here is just another example where you can even go back and you identify species, you identify capture methods and regions, and then you identify companies. You identify retailers that are doing uh, better things, retailers that are doing, uh, 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 suppliers that are doing uh, bad things or worse things, suppliers that are doing better things. And then you can create a positive interaction where you can provide an uh, 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 insightful identification of what is, what is needed to mimic the good stuff that are happening. Because we all know being on the supply chain, not everyone is bad and not everyone is good. It's not really black and white. We have a very good, interesting case studies and how people are really caring and doing things well. Uh, the only challenge is how to bring those case studies and bring to a much higher level or from an entire industry or entire region or an entire supply chain. Uh, the real objective of this uh, conversation today is to talk of, of what I call the, the real deal, which is it's not just about reporting, it's not just about analyzing data, but bringing it all together. So we've been part of this ACO welfare project, which is started here in Brazil with Tilapia, and we are now also doing uh, Thailand and China with tilapia, carp, and shrimp, and shrimp in Brazil as well. So we are bringing all those uh, understanding and knowledge and expertise uh, in terms to put uh, a system or a framework from the ground, starting with definition, started with the definition of partners, data collection, review, and scientific publication, adapt science to, into commercial aspects on farm level, and of course, giving the necessary feedback and learning tools to those uh, agents of the supply chain in order to be able to improve. Uh, this example is from Brazil. So we have very uh, interesting companies participating on these actions. Global Peixe is one of the largest fingerling producers in Brazil. BTJ Group is a very interesting company that is starting with a set of mine on the tilapia production in the country and are together with us on this journey to get it right from the beginning and Genesis is the largest uh, uh, Brazilian uh, tilapia exporter. They, they decided to go through this journey, they decided to give hand to hand and together with them we are uh, providing very practical solutions in order to improve the day to day of the animals and of the people and of course uh, generating better economics for them as well and of course this comes together with several with small, medium, and big size farmers. Also, we understand institutional and academic partners are is a very important part. So we have LABEA, which is the Brazilian Animal Welfare Lab from Paraná State University, UNESP is another university with agriculture center. We have extension from uh, Santa Catarina State. So extension is that are working daily with fish farmers on small and medium-sized scales, uh, applying the protocols and procedures and the structures. And we have WIORA, which is a, a, a local uh, group of experts that are supporting on the development and this outreach of different species. Because when we speak about fish welfare, it's not like poultry welfare or broiler, it's tilapia welfare, salmon welfare, shrimp welfare, different species, different uh, needs and we need to address that uh, very specifically. Uh, if you want to take a look on how our assessment, it was the first one on the tilapia, on the tilapia were to be done, we've been able to do it scientifically proof, but also very applicable 
to the farm level. And the idea is not to be a, a, a finger pointing approach, is a problem solving approach. And the result of that is that those guidelines and those introduction to animal welfare and the relation between health and welfare, nutrition and welfare, they will all be, uh, are available already for free. Uh, so, for, so the producers can uh, take advantage of that, can learn. And we have different experts, different stakeholders participating in all of these. Uh, if you want to take a look, go to our uh, FAI.academy website. It's free for everyone. And please spread the news because it's interactive and you can now really learn and apply it on your company or on your farm, how to better assess the welfare. And of course, after that, you can benchmark with certification schemes like GAP uh, or other or ASC, or uh, they can, you can identify if what you are doing is corresponding to what, what our people are demanding or if you're a supplier. So our approach is uh, health, environment, behavior, and nutrition, uh, reviewing science, identifying parameters, uh, and of course, selecting uh, a, a simplified methodology for the farmer can identify how far he is from optimum in terms of the individual or the group welfare inside their production system. Uh, and this, that doesn't stop here. The challenge is, is how do we continue improvement and outreach? Having a nice page or a training course, we understand it's not enough and we don't have enough people uh, as experts to go on every single farm and to really make the difference on the day-to-day -day actions on the farm. So we understand that the outreach could be a little bit different. That's why we are now in the final process of an application that will be used by the farmer in order to identify uh, where he is or where she is or where they are in terms of uh, their welfare uh, inside, inside the gate. Uh, it will not just collect the metrics, but they also give immediate feedback. We'll uh, progress uh, and monitor, mo monitoring progress. And the other benefits, ideally what we want is once the information is in there, he can identify if he's ready or not to go the next step, which is a certification that can give him access to, to better markets. So it, everything is going to be geographically referenced. So Brazil, are going to be the farming in Brazil, Thailand, and China. We are starting with those three countries and we are really excited for the journey because we know that uh, if the tool is not easy enough or simple enough and reliable enough to collect those information, people just don't use it. So we are spending a lot of time and a lot of connections with the farmers, our baseline farmers, to really get this journey right. So this application can be really useful on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, uh, help to scale up how we are measuring and how we are improving animal welfare on a more wider perspective. And as I said, we are doing the same thing for shrimp and carp. It's the same framework. We are now in the process of the draft uh, uh, standards or metrics for carp which we start testing on Brazil and China in the following months. And early next January, we starting with the process with shrimp, which is a, again, a new challenge. Science behind that is very sparse. We need to, to have more support on that, but we are very confident that this uh, will work. So this is a little bit what, what you're, we are doing. I am happy to spend more time to go through days or hours with any of you talking about that. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I like to do. So don't, don't be afraid of bothering me by emails or phone calls. But the take home message for me is that animal welfare, animal welfare science and practical application is as important too to reduce environmental impact to increase economical resilience and to support social development. We understand, FAI understand that we are in a process of change now where the farmers are understanding that they really have the power and they can with the land, the water and the way they do produce, they can be a little bit more 
uh, level with the big industries or the big retailers or the, or the big supply chains in order to, to demonstrate that they are doing good things. They can impact pos positively their land, their world and their community. So, and we want to help them to do that on a very reliable, practical way and meaningful way for the supply chain. We understand that change is a process. We cannot draw a mark where you are doing things in a way and you just stop. And this process in our perspective is towards improvement of trends where citizens are looking for better products, are looking for transparency and transparency starts on the farm. And the final goal is to improve quality of life of people and animals. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your time and your patience. I'm looking forward for the questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Maria. We, we let you go a little over time because you're just teasing us with uh, this treasure trove of information that's available through your website and through your organization. I'm definitely going to spend some time exploring those maps. Um, really, really fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, without further ado, I think we have to keep the agenda hopping along here. So over to you, Catalina, and uh, then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Great. Can you see my screen? Yes, it looks perfect. Thanks. Perfect. Great. So let's start. So thank you, um, Shannon and Maria, for your presentations. They were super interesting. And I'm going to focus a little bit on the why. Um, um, they focused how we do it and what kind of partners um, the industry can find. But I want to focus on why they should actually do these changes as well. So um, I'm going to talk a little about what the Mizzen link is. So a little about us, for those of you who do not know the Aquatic Life Institute, um, our organization was founded in 2019 to address um, the gap in the animal protection movement regarding aquatic animals. And we work to reduce the suffering of aquatic animals exploited for food around the world um, through science-based advocacy. Uh, specifically with corporations, governments, and international institutions. And a key pillar for us is building coalitions with animal welfare and conservations or conservation organizations around the world to improve our impact and effectiveness. So our two main coalitions are the Aquatic Animal Alliance and the Coalition for Aquatic Conservation. So you probably all have heard about the World Health Organization's framework called One Health. So this approach um, states that in order to have a healthy human population, uh, we must also have a healthy animal population and a healthy environment. So as a result, policies and strategies at every level must include the three aspects to achieve real impact. So from that framework, a new framework related to welfare called One Welfare was created. So human welfare is not only related to health. Um, you would not define that a human is well just because they are physically healthy, right? So welfare is a much broader concept. And similarly, similarly to health, when we talk about welfare, we must also address the three same aspects to achieve true impact in improving welfare. So human well-being is directly impacted by the welfare of animals and the conservation of the environment. If we fail to include one of those dimensions, or um, if we can imagine like in this picture that a, one whole side of this umbrella is broken or missing, we would definitely still get wet, right? Uh, the umbrella wouldn't be very effective. So we must incorporate all the three dimensions to ensure that our umbrella works and protects us from the rain or in real terms, ensure that the policies and strategies that are designed to improve human well-being include animal welfare and conservation strategies. Unfortunately, until very recently, animal welfare was not included in conversation related to sustainable development goals or conservation. And this happened in all levels of society, including governments, companies, academia, and even nonprofit organizations that advocate for policy changes um, in the food system. So it was really the missing link in the conversation. 
a part of the umbrella has been missing for all this time. And as a result, interventions uh, on improving sustainability have come short to expectations. Um, fortunately, this is shifting and finally animal welfare is starting to be a part of the conversation, although it is still not giving the importance it should receive. So now it's important to understand what the concept of animal welfare actually means. Um, so when I trained as a veterinarian, uh, not too long ago, <laughs> we learned that you know, the welfare of animals used for food was measured on their productivity levels or um, their productivity standards and the mortality rates. So meaning that if the animals do not die and gain weight, then they're doing great. Uh, of course, we know now, and as Mario mentioned, this is a very outdated concept because health or productivity parameters are just a fraction of what welfare encompasses. So we need a holistic approach to animal welfare, which considers both positive and negative physical and psychological experiences of the animals. This is key to maintaining a healthy immune system, minimizing the probability of disease outbreaks, and also psychological welfare considerations, which include reducing stress, fear, frustration, and negative emotions in general, while at the same time providing mentally stimulating environments for the animals can ultimately contribute to improved physical health as well. So in a food production system that is highly intensive like aquaculture, coupled with low animal welfare considerations, the results are, can be dire and include poor health of the animals, high disease rates, antibiotic use, high mortality rates, um, also environmental and ecosystem impacts, and ultimately lower resource efficiency and productivity, which is the opposite of sustainability. So this suggests that a holistic approach to animal welfare must become an integral pillar of sustainable development policies moving forward anywhere where intensive aquaculture or fisheries take place. So any corporation or government that is committed to improving sustainability must take animal welfare interventions into account. So we at the Aquatic Life Institute and our aquatic um, coalitions, we have five key pillars of aquatic animal welfare that guide our recommendations to the different stakeholders, including the industry, of course, so these pillars are um, on the screen. So they include water quality, space requirements, and stocking density, feed and feed composition, stunning and slaughter, and finally, environmental enrichment. And we have focused a lot of our efforts in this last category because it has been largely ignored for fish welfare um, until recently. And it is a key aspect in promoting positive welfare for the animals as we saw. So I will not dive into this today, uh, but you can find our comprehensive welfare guide on our website if you're interested in learning more. So having our welfare recommendations as a base, we at the Aquatic Life Institute and our Alliance members, we are actively working with the industry to raise awareness about the importance of including strong animal welfare policies in their supply chains or in their strategies not only for the benefit of the animals, but as we saw for the effect it has on other sustainability goals. So improving animal welfare can lead to improved food safety and security, better labor conditions for workers, reduction of poverty and inequality, uh, reduction of food waste, um, reducing environmental degradation and carbon emissions, which are you know, key right now due to the climate emergency that we're facing and also increasing the resiliency of food supply chains, uh, which we will become even more important when we start facing um, the, the um, challenges related to climate change. So a lot of companies and governments and institutions around the world are aligning to meet the global sustainable development goals that you see in the screen. So animal welfare interventions in aquaculture and fishing can support their efforts in achieving these goals in almost every one of the development goals in different aspects. So the companies that do not align with these goals will lose competitive advantages um, as consumers you know, are demanding more responsibility from industries 
and they are basing their purchasing choices on the company's impact on the environment and animals and society. And this trend is only growing and expected to increase as the climate emergency becomes more um, dire. And the commitments from you know, global leaders fall short, uh, usually as we saw it recently at, at the COP26 summit, where you know, the food systems are barely even discussed. Um, so you know, in the future, it will also be harder for companies to find financing uh, as companies that do not include uh, the sustainable development goals on their strategies, they will have higher risk of becoming redundant. Um, so it will be more expensive for them to find funding as well. So there's an economical reason to um, create these frameworks that include animal welfare, um, you know, for this economic sustainability of the companies. So I'm not gonna, you know, dive into deeply into this um, conversation today because I did a presentation on this on Tuesday. And if you didn't um, see it live, we do have it um, recorded. But our corporate engagement strategy in general will involve um, you know, starting negotiations with these companies that maybe have existing strong welfare policies for other species, and they have a strong corporate social responsibility culture. Um, who will probably be more open to learn more about the issues related to the aquaculture industry in terms of welfare and how can include including animal welfare policies uh, in their strategies can help uh, them meet their sustainable development goals. So as more companies join the ranks of those including aquatic animal welfare on their standards, their competitors will have to shift as well to stay you know, relevant and competitive in consumers' eyes as we have seen has happened in, you know, in other movements for other species like the KHP movement and improving the conditions for broilers in the meat industry. Um, so you know, competitors will have to shift as well to stay relevant and competitive in the consumer's eyes because the purchasing decisions are shifting, especially in the younger generations. Um, they're more aligned, their values are more aligned with sustainability and food justice. Um, so they will definitely make purchasing decisions according to those values. Um, the next step would be increasing awareness uh, for those companies that are lagging behind. Uh, make sure they understand, you know, they need to change to remain competitive. And finally, accountability will be a key aspect, you know, by ensuring companies are indeed sourcing uh, products that, you know, have uh, animal welfare standards. And, you know, they're doing this continuously and consistently. Um, you know, for this end, we want to work with certifications like GAP uh, and companies like FAI, because we understand that companies cannot do, them, do this themselves. Um, they need support and, um, you know, they need um, to kind of understand how these changes can impact their supply chain and do these changes um, you know, in a continuous way and sustainable way. Now, on the other hand, as, you know, animal protection organizations, we will have to step out of our comfort zones many of the times to ensure that we work collaboratively with the industry, uh, but also listen to the challenges of the implementation of these commitments and find solutions with all stakeholders. It is very tempting to just want to control the narrative and you know, be right about what we're saying, um, come up with possible solutions from you know, our own bubble as animal protection organizations, but really the most sustainable change will come from willingness to change by the industry themselves. Um, and this will be more feasible if we work with them rather than against them, if that makes sense. So this is our objective at the Aquatic Animal Alliance um, and you know our coalitions as a whole. So if you are interested in joining one of our coalitions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I will put my email in the chat in a bit. And you know, just as a conclusion, aquatic animal welfare should be a priority in order to meet our sustainable development goals. Um, and you know, every actor and a stakeholder needs to put it in the agenda. So hopefully you can all work on your areas of influence to make sure that uh, this important issue is included. And thank you. Uh, looking forward to your questions.
Thank you so much, Catalina. Um, and thank you for sharing your perspectives. That's fantastic. We have a number of questions that have come in here. Um, but just before we dive in, we have about five minutes for questions. And I apologize for the very unfortunate lighting scenario in, in my space. It's breakfast time in my house. So I've been relegated to a different corner of the house that uh, <laughs> doesn't show up so nicely on screen, but we'll make do. Um, so first question, and maybe we could um, try to answer these in sort of a minute each, if possible. Uh, first question is for Shannon. Since your audit uh, is conducted every 15 months, how long does it take for renewal of the accredited certification? So um, we use our third party certifiers to go out and audit farms every 15 months or terrestrial farms at least. And usually I would say like three or four months in advance of that like expiry date, the certifier will reach out to the farm and say, hey, you're going to be up in another three months, you know, let's schedule your audit, let's work with you to do that. So that's really on our third party certifiers to make sure that they're working with farms, keeping track of all that and ensuring that they're getting renewed in time. So there's not some large gap, obviously, in between certification. Does that Great. answer the question? <laughs> I believe that it does. Ho hopefully Great. it does for the person who posed it as well. Thanks. Uh, next question for Catalina. Do you have any concrete advice for advocates for getting involved in working with companies on welfare commitments? So I suppose this could be either in, you know, individual advocates or um, NGOs and so on. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, the most important thing is do your research first. Um, so kind of map out the industry, understand who are the main players, um, and also kind of learn a little about their existing commitments in terms of animal welfare and sustainability. Uh, because once you have a partner in the industry, it's easier to go to other companies and show examples of other companies that are doing this. Um, so, you know, also personal contacts always help. So if you know someone that works at a company or can introduce you to someone at a company, that's always key. And I think creating personal relationships with uh, executives from companies, uh, it's very important that they know you as a person. Sometimes we just like, see a company as this like abstract being, but actually humans work at these companies. So you just get to know the humans, work with them, and you will see that collaboration is a lot easier when you stop seeing it as just an entity, but more humans are working as well. And they can hear what you have to say if you take the time to build those relationships. Perfect, thank you. So. Um... Collaboration and finding that commonality is, is key with individuals with, within an organization. Um, next question is for Murillo. What are some of the innovations that are happening to improve aquatic animal welfare through FAI farms or the industry in general? So innovations. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, the aquaculture, uh, for fish farming, I would say that having a systematic approach in how to assess welfare, I can consider an innovation because with the countries that we work with, when we talk about uh, even simple things like water temperature, some of the farmers just, it's hotter, it's cold, and th simple things like that. It's, I, I consider this knowledge transfer a very powerful and strong innovation, but in terms of the scalability of those levels of knowledge and better control and better assessment. I would say that tools that can guarantee the farm has a track of what's going on on their farm uh, during transportation or in pre-slaughter system. System is very important. What we see as granted in some supply chains like broiler or pigs or uh, uh, beef cattle is they are inexistent in tilapia, shrimp, or carp. Uh, so we are trying to bring this all together. First is the the culture of collecting information, analyzing it properly, and have the interesting feedback so you can drive progress. And of course, that includes biosecurity. That includes all the simple aspects that all together can guarantee a better quality of life 
uh, on the wide catch, I would say understanding the type of equipment you are using to do that, understanding the biology and interaction between different species, uh, and of course all the uh, the aspects of the biodiversity. This is very important. We have as person having projects on on different types of nets, different types of capture methods that avoid uh, 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 a bycatch at some extent. So uh, several several activities around it. Wonderful. Thank you, Murillo. Um, maybe we have time for one more question and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, and this is either for Shannon or Murillo. For people that don't know, what are some current aquatic animal welfare practices that exist within the industry already? Shannon, Real. did you want to go first? Sure, sure. Um, so I can really only speak to farmed Atlantic salmon, but in terms of some of the things that has been developed in that industry, I would say uh, humane slaughter and stunning are really big. Um, they were probably the first of the farmed fin fish to really push that. Um, and I would say majority, if not all of um, salmon farms use humane stunning and slaughter methods so that's really great um, and I would say also for salmon just in terms of monitoring it's come a long way um, sea lice are obviously still a problem and lots of things being done for that but I know many companies that are starting to use computers, machine learning, AI to begin to like take photographs of fish in the water so they don't need to pull fish out to be looking for sea legs. It can all be done via computer. So um, that's a really exciting avenue as well, just to make sure that the fish are staying in the water while they're being monitored. Um, so I say those are the two kind of big ones uh, for salmon, at least. Super, thank you so much. Anything to add to that, Murillo? Yes, just to reinforce the situation regarding stunning, which we are not as developed at talking about tilapia, for example, as the salmon industry. And the majority of the countries we work with, uh, the largest proportion of uh, stunning are still done by asphyxiation or ice, which are not a deal. And the awareness that this is not correct is starting together with those activities. The largest exporters, of course, they understand that and have specific equipment, but in terms of the technology around that, one of the challenges is different fish sizes, different standards, same machine, how, how you work with that to really make a proper stunning is just not providing electrical chalk to, to, to the animal. It's really guaranteed that it's being properly stunning. So we are being happy to implement the assessment if the animal is proper, is being properly stunning. We have developed a way of analyzing that on the, for the tilapia, which is, which is quite useful. And in that, in that aspect, just a remark is, is, is very interesting because now one of the advice we are giving when people making marketing or advertisement about fish where they show the fish out of the water. We've been talking to people about that. And it's the same as a beef cattle farmer putting the head of the calf inside the water and take a nice picture. So this type of thing is just open people's eyes and it's not real technology, but it's a sense of yes, fish feels and you need to try, start taking, taking more care of that. So that's the level of, of work. It's also really important. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to underscore that point that it is, you know, about opening people's consciousness and thinking differently and changing perspectives. So even, even starting the conversation there about pulling a fish out of water is unnatural and very likely uh, stressful and traumatic. So uh, that's something that's very easy, I think, to, um, to change in terms of practices. Okay, well, we have so many other questions that have rolled in. I'm sorry that we're out of time. We are going to have to wrap because our next session is starting in just over five minutes time. Um, our panelists have very generously shared their emails. Um, you can also reach out to them through the Whova app. So please, I encourage our participants to do so to continue the conversation. Uh, but we will wrap up now. So thank you so much to Murillo, to Shannon, to Catalina 
for your um, generous insights and, uh, and presentations today. Thank you for everyone in the audience who joined us. Please keep your eye out for post-conference communications so that we can continue to stay involved in this conversation together. Our next session, which is starting in five minutes, is uh, titled Food System Intersectionality. So definitely stay tuned for that. Lots of interesting information will be shared there as well. And then please continue to follow the Aquatic Life Institute on our social media channels, as well as visit ali.fish, our website, for more information. Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the last day of this conference. Take care.